One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Check one, two, one, two, one, two.
All right. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the interview room here at Little Caesars Arena as we preview the 2024 NCAA Midwest Regional Final here in Detroit. We're pleased to be joined by the second-seeded Tennessee Volunteers, who will face top seed of Purdue on Sunday at 2.20 p.m. on CBS. Please remember to silence your cell phones as a courtesy to the team members and other media in the room. Please raise your hand for a microphone to be brought to you, and when you do ask a question, please introduce yourself and your media affiliation. Please note that the recording of press conferences on cameras or on cell phones is prohibited throughout the rest of the Midwest Regional. From your left to your right, we are joined by head coach Rick Barnes, Jordan Ganey, Dalton Connect, Jemai Meshack, and Josiah Jordan-James. Tennessee student-athletes will be available until 3.10 p.m., and then we'll continue with Coach Barnes for an additional 20 minutes. Uh, in the meantime, the student-athletes will make their way to the breakout rooms off to your immediate right when you depart the interview room here. Coach, if you wouldn't mind starting us out with an opening statement, we'll then open it up for questions. Obviously, we're excited to be here and going up against a, a team that we played earlier in the year over in, in Honolulu. And um, so they're familiar with us. We're familiar with them. Uh, going back, looking at that tape last night, uh, both teams have improved a lot since then. But uh, And it was a really hard-fought game over there. A uh, lot of fouls called in the game. I don't think it will be that many called here. But, uh, uh, again, we uh, I'm really excited for these guys to have a chance to go back and, and play Purdue again. Thanks, Coach. Let's go to questions for the student athletes or Coach Barnes. We'll start with on the right side here in the fourth row. Myron Metcalf, ESPN. For Dalton, what do you do, you know, with the film of the first game? Do you think you can take a lot from that, or is it just a completely different situation? Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely will watch that film with Coach Barnes and stuff and watching how they uh, got at the gaps because I remember – they turned me over quite a bit uh, in the second half by getting in those gaps. So I just got to be ready for that and kick it out to my teammates earlier. First row here on the left. Vidant Gupta, Global Media. Coach Barnes, I heard in the background you're telling a lot of stories about your relationships with different coaches. Coach Campy was here, obviously supporting you. Now you're in the Elite Eight. Talk about the love and support you're getting from the people that you know, the coaches across the country at this stage. Well, people would probably be surprised how many coaches we have really terrific relationships. And uh, and I've been, again, doing it a long time and have had a chance to uh, be around a lot of good people. And uh, I've really enjoyed watching what Matt Painter's done with this program and how he's built it and what he's done and the consistency with it. But, uh, yeah, this time of year you'll get texts from different people and all that, uh, which I think every coach does. And uh, – but uh, just, again, having a chance to continue to play in a tournament that's hard to advance through and get to this point is uh, uh, something that, uh, again, these guys, we're all proud of it, but uh, we'd like to be able to keep moving. But it's going to take a great effort to do that. We have two questions on the left side. Coach, um, before the Sweet 16 matchup, Matt Painter kind of talked about his group around Zach Eady. Obviously, it's a short scout. You've played them before. Um, the focal point's going to be the nas reigning national player of the year. But what do you see from those guys around Zach Eady maybe that makes this Purdue team better than other ones you've seen before? Well, he, he, had a, uh, he got in foul trouble over there, and those guys were the ones that did the damage. I mean, they, 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 he's got a really great support around him, a cast of guys that they know each other. They, they run extremely well. They uh, know how to play together. They uh, know when uh, – you know, he's a great run stopper in Zach Eady. I mean, he's a guy that when you get something going, they can slow down. They know how to get him the ball. And he knows where he wants to catch the ball. But he, uh, again, Matt uh, has done a, just a terrific job of putting the pieces around him that uh, has got him where they have been all year, which is basically the number one team in the country or one, two team in the country and the success they've had the past couple of years. And, and it's, it's more difficult than you think when you've got a guy as dominant as, as Zach is to – get those guys to uh, understand how it's got to be played, but um, he's done a terrific job doing it. Second row. Uh, Dane O'Neill with The Athletic. Rick, you talked about Matt's program building, and I think you both kind of are similar in, in kind of maybe fly, fly, defying the odds of what you're supposed to be able to do these days with program building. Why does it work? I mean, a lot of people would argue that you guys are old school and it's not the way of the world anymore. Well, again, it, it, people can look at it any way they want it, but I think that coaches, first of all, have to stay true to themselves in terms of what they believe in and their core values. You can't get away from that. And 
you know, there's no doubt that he is a player development type coach. We pride ourselves on the same thing. And I was talking earlier with someone how much uh, Josiah, Santi, and, and the time they've been with us has improved, and certainly Zakai, but everybody on our team has. I mean, I think we've all improved from the beginning of the year. But uh, I just think you've got to be willing to make the adjustments from year to year that you look at your program, what do you need? But uh, we, we believe, like we think we have a terrific freshman class that when uh, these older guys leave and their time's up that they're going to be able to slide in there. And that's what we've tried to build our program on. Uh, obviously, these two guys to my left, have, uh, we knew we needed to get offense and out of the portal last year, and we were able to do that. But um, I think, again, we're going to continue to do what we think has been successful for us. Going to flip it over to the right side, the second row. Rob Lewis with VolQuest.com. Josiah, just with Zakai, how, I mean, just because of how, you know, where he was in November when you guys played the first time, how much different are you guys as a team? How much better? Yeah, the, you know, he was just coming back from his ACL injury and, you know, he was kind of hesitant. He wasn't really himself and we really didn't expect him to be, but, you know, he's had a lot of experience up until this point. He's definitely exceeded the expectations that we had and, you know, he's playing his best basketball right now and he's the leader. He's the, the engine that gets us going. And so we will, will, will rely on him heavily. And they'll see a difference as Zakai Ziegler come tomorrow. Back in the fifth row here on the right side. Um, my question is uh, for Josiah. Both these teams, Purdue and Tennessee, both are on the same quest. They need, Tennessee has never been to a Final Four. It's been a long time for Purdue. What's been the demeanor as somebody who's been with Tennessee for your whole career? in the locker room as you've progressed on this quest, uh, how have the players handled it? Obviously being grateful for the position that we're in, for the group of guys that we have, but knowing that you know we want something even better. We want to be the last team standing. And so being able to, to be proud of where we're at and taking steps forward to that, but also knowing that you know it doesn't end here and having more hunger and more fight and wanting to make history and be that last team standing. Stick in the third row here on the right side at the end. Ryan Sylvia, Rivals.com. Jemai, just how do you feel like the post play on this team has improved since that trip to Hawaii? One more time. Say that one more time. Just how do you feel like the post play on this team has improved since Hawaii? Um, I definitely feel like uh, it, it's improved a lot. Uh, I, I think it's given Tobe and Jonas, um, our SEC play, it's given them a lot of experience to guard a lot of really good post players. And I think that was something that we didn't have when we played them the first time. Um, you know, it's definitely important. It, it, you know, it's easier said than done, but uh, I think they're really getting a lot better at positioning themselves, pushing their the bigs off the block, making sure that they're physical but without fouling, and just making sure that they're staying between them and, and him in the basket. And um, it's going to make it easier for the guards if we easier for the bigs if we pressure the the ball as guards and, and get into the basketball. But um, I definitely feel like they they've improved a lot since since the beginning of the year, and I think that's another thing that's going to be a focal point in this game. And people are going to see just how, how, be how much better they got um, from then to now. We've got two questions in the fourth row on the left. Coach, uh, Akeem Glassby, Indy Star. Uh, for a player of Zach Eadie's size to, to log the minutes that he does, just what does it say about his just the level of conditioning and kind of the, the preparation that he put in for this season? Well, I think when you look at Zach Eady, I mean, from a coaching standpoint, and I think players too, you always appreciate the fact that someone gets better the way he has. I mean, he's gotten better and better every year. He runs. He, he uh, uh, you know, we'd like to think you could get guys tired, but he, uh, I think he moves extremely well. I think that's the difference in where he was a couple of years ago. He's really being able to move. He, he's a he's a good screener, uh, but he knows exactly on the court where he wants to get his space and where he wants to set up, and they do a great job of getting it to him when he gets there. But his improvement is what's really impressive. I mean, uh, I think the first time we played him, I think he missed a lot of free throws, if I remember. I think he missed a bunch. I wish he'd do it again, but uh, uh, but that game, was, there was a lot of fouls in that game. I think, we, I think they shot 48 free throws. I think we shot a bunch too, but uh, – He's just improved, and that's what you admire about him. You admire players who get better from year to year. Stick in the fourth row here. Larry Leach from the Associated Press. Rick, as a, a fan of the game, can you at all appreciate this matchup 
uh, Dalton and Edie, two All-Americas players, um, two programs desperately seeking a Final Four. Can any part of you kind of enjoy that? Well, when, when I look at look at that, I think that Purdue and Tennessee, those guys are great basketball players, but their supporting cast that I'm not sure if I'd call it a supporting cast or teammates are va just as valuable. And uh, like last night, I thought that uh, uh, Zakai and Jemai and uh, and uh, Josiah, especially their leadership, their demeanor at the beginning of the game last night was exactly what we needed. And when I look at Purdue, they, they've got the same thing with their key guys. I don't think anybody's here because of, I mean, certainly Dalton's made a big impact on our basketball team. And, uh, I mean, Zach Eady, I mean, he's had the spotlight on him forever. But uh, it's two really balanced teams that have depth that I think you're going to see because we, we, we played a lot of people over there. I think we played 10 or 11 people we, because we got in such foul trouble. And But uh, it, it's both teams really – they're more than just the, the the main event that you're talking about. I mean, those guys, they've deserved every honor that they've gotten, but they would tell you, both of them would tell you that they would defer to their teammates for helping them get what they've gotten done. We've got three questions on the right side. We'll start in the fourth row. Jordan, I think you hit a three in the first game, 3-10 to play, tied the game, and I think Dalton hit a late three to cut it to three. What do you have to do differently in this matchup if you're in the same situation to finish strong and for the outcome to work out in your favor? Really just stick to the script throughout the whole entire game, you know, uh, making sure we don't give them easy points and make sure they don't really get to the free throw line. Like Coach said, there's a lot of fouls called that game and make sure we just stay solid and making everything tough and nothing easy in the paint for them. Okay, back up to the second row here. Coach, can you just give us an update on Santi? Can you just give us an update on Santi? Yeah, uh, he looked better today. He's with us, and uh, we won't obviously do very much today, and we'll just see really more so tomorrow, I think, once we get going. But uh, he, he's, he, we expect him to be ready. And then to the third row to wrap it up on the right side here. Uh, Jordan and Dalton, just as transfers, is there a gain comfort level at this point in the year, maybe compared to when you first played Purdue? Who was that directed to? To Jordan. Um, I'd say, you know, with games at this high level, it's uh, as the game goes on, you get more comfortable within the play and just start to get a real good feel of the game. And just being able to have my teammates here just giving me support throughout the whole entire game, make sure that I'm staying confident and doing whatever I need to do on the court is just amazing. And big shout out to those guys. We'll go to the left side in the first row. Casey Bartley, Boiler Upload. Josiah, just how different is it from hearing about Zach Eady to now having experience dealing with him on the court? Yeah, I feel like experience is the best teacher. And, you know, we have 40 minutes to play against him and his entire team. And we'll go back and, you know, watching that film, we, we weren't at our best. We've grown a lot, but they have as well. But, you know, just turning down on the turnovers and staying within our principles on the defensive end will be huge. They have a really, really good team. It's going to be a physical battle, but we're more than up to the challenge. We'll stick on the left side in the second row. Uh, Dana O'Neill at The Athletic. Josiah, along those terms, that we were talking a lot about fouls, and, and that's what Zach Eady does. He leads the nations in fouls drawn. What can you guys do collectively to not get in foul trouble? Yeah, like Jemai said, our, our post players, JP, um, Jonas, and Tobey, have, have grown so much. Uh, Shaq also guarded him a little bit as well. Um, they, they've, they've grown so much, and like he said, SEC play has prepared us for a guy like him. Obviously, it's easier said than done, but just making sure that we stay between him and the basket uh, and on all their guys is huge because it wasn't just him getting to the foul line. We kind of didn't stick to the script looking back at the film from that first game, and so just making sure that you know, no matter what happens, if they go on a run, uh, that we stay uh, with the game plan that we have in place. We're going to go back over to the right here in the third row. Rick, hey, uh, Greg Doyle with Indianapolis Star. You used your opening statement and then a question about Edie to reference twice all the fouls called in that first game. Are you kind of sending a message to the officials tomorrow? Well, uh, based on the way the tournament's been called, about half of those fouls wouldn't have been called. I can assure you that. And I, you know, and it, but it's early in the year, and I've said all along. I think the hardest thing about when you start uh, like we do every year. I've always thought that we should be able to play more exhibition games to give referees a chance to get more experience before you get thrown into, like, the, the Maui tournament this year. I mean, think of it. It was 
it was loaded. And uh, some of the referees there hadn't been in those type games in, what, six months. And uh, – but both teams played hard. I mean, if you, if you watch it to go back and watch that, I mean, it was a hard fall. That tournament was all from start to finish. But uh, at the time, I mean, you know, again, referees are getting started. We're getting started. And uh, did we foul? Yeah, we fouled some. Did they foul some? Yeah, they fouled some too. And the referees missed some? Yeah, they missed some too. But uh, that was – Everybody getting started, and you you really kind of expect that early in the year. A couple more minutes with the players. We'll flip it back to the left side and row two. Josh Orsch, fan side at Dalton. At near the end of the regular season in SEC play, you had some really high scoring games, and then the SEC tournament, one and done there. How have you found a balance between getting your teammates involved and looking for your own shot? Because it seemed like in the NCAA tournament, that's been a better balance for you guys offensively. Yeah, I just say. Uh just reading the secondary defender and seeing how my one dribble would affect uh, I could get a wide open shot versus me getting a teammate wide open shot. So I'll just say just reading that secondary defender and just, you know, I got trust in all my teammates and got the confidence in them to go up and shoot that three and knock it down. Back to the fifth row here on the right. Uh, Todd Golden with CNHI. Uh, Rick, a uh, lot of questions obviously about Zach Eady, but he's got to get the ball. Uh, what's kind of the art of attacking the post feed to him? Uh, how much do you fall back on the last game and just on your general principles on how to handle that? Well, the art of it, it's got to be a team defense. I mean, uh, again, he's, he's a, a terrific player. And, again, I, I, I admire anybody that knows where his space is to work and works hard to get there. And, again, Matt has some great schemes to – not let you see the same thing over and over, but he knows what he's looking for. His teammates knows where he, he needs to get it, when he needs to get it. And uh, so with that said, it takes five guys being connected defensively. And, and uh, uh, you know, Jemai talked about uh, ball pressure, important, because if you they're such a good passing team, if you don't uh, try to take their vision away a little bit, they're going to put it on, on the dime, on time. And, and uh, But it's taking all five guys to stay connected and and working to try to make it as tough as possible. Because he, he's going to get his points. He, he's, he's too good a player. He, he understands his space so well. And um, one of the hardest things to do is to keep him off the offensive boards. I mean, he's a hard guy to guard when he misses his own shot. And uh, it's, it's just a talent. He's, he's good at it. And uh, But that's a very difficult – there's not a drill for that. I, I wish there were, but there's not. He's just uh, it's great hands. and. He's right there at the rim, and when they come off, he's got a great way of getting it back and putting it back in. And But he does a good job rebounding, too. You've, you've got to try to keep him from getting too close because he can get his hands on so many balls and slap them out. But um, I mean, he's a hard cover. He really is. we got more on the, one more on the right side here. We'll get one more time for one more uh, question sure, for the player. Sure, thank you. Rick Russo, WVLT, Knoxville. Rick, Pat Summit used to say that this round, the Elite Eight, may very well be the toughest round in the tournament because everybody's trying to get to that Final Four. Do you think that might – you've been there, obviously. Do you think that might be the case? I, I think they're all tough. I mean, first of all, getting into tournament's tough. I mean, you, it's, I mean, it's a grind to get there every year. And, and, uh, but getting started because of the, the pressure of being in it uh, and you know your people around you, you, you feel it, especially for guys that haven't been there. And, uh, but yet we've we've seen the the magical runs by teams, the upsets and all that. Now with every seed winning a game at some point, and then uh, the next one, and it's, so they're all difficult. But the one thing is, you continue to move. You know you're playing against a team that's playing well, or they wouldn't be where they are. And uh, so that's again, you'd like to think that most teams right now are playing at an extremely high level, and hope that uh, we can con we can continue to do that. Okay, we're all set with the student athletes, guys. Thanks for your time. You can go out to the breakout rooms. Those are to your immediate right when you exit the back of the media room here. We'll continue here in just a second with Coach Barnes. Okay. We'll get those nameplates to the media room here as well. Okay, uh, we'll continue with Coach Barnes. We'll start here in the second row, the third row, on the right. Hey, Rick, uh, David Cobb from CBS Sports. Uh, how have you seen the Tennessee Athletic Department leadership and the commitment to basketball evolve over your nine years? 
it, it's been it's been great. When Dave Hart hired me, the one thing he did say to me he said, "I'd like for you to really build a program, uh, a program that we can watch grow." And uh, and obviously, I think we need to talk about building a program. You're talking about consistency, having a chance to be in the fight every year, and having a chance to be highly competitive. And certainly, um, uh, in the league that we're in, uh, we've been given the resources. But uh, over the from the time that Dave left, we've had different uh, leadership, uh, not just in the athletic department, but at the top of the university. And I don't think there's a university in the country right now that has the leadership that we have with Randy Boyd as our president of the UT system. And what Don D. Plowman has done on campus is uh, phenomenal. And then uh, Danny White coming in, I mean, I don't know uh, how he's done it, but he has just totally transformed so much around our athletic program and our facilities. and. And uh, so they, they deserve a lot of credit for setting the tone of where they want the University of Tennessee to be. Coach, let's go to the left side here in the second row. Wes Rucker, 24-7 C- uh, Sports. Rick, when you – you know Santi for a while, obviously, and what have the past few days and your interactions with him, how tough has it been on him, especially given everything that happened in the fall? Well, well he, he was sick. I mean, you, you just had to look at him. I mean, you know, we try, obviously tried to quarantine him as quick as we could to keep him away from the team. And, but when we were around him and he was seeing everything we were doing by Zoom in his room, uh, knowing if he could, there's any way possible, because, you know, Santi, as you guys know, has a great basketball IQ, and he knows what we're doing as well as I know what we're trying to get done. And, but he just, he, he, he couldn't. He, he thought he, had, he did break the fever, and we thought he was going to be okay. Then the fever came back. and. And uh, but you could tell by just when we were around him, he was uh, looked like he had no energy. But uh, and, and we hate it for him because he's been such a huge part of the program, and and obviously he is. And I just hope today he feels like he's got some energy back. We're gonna go to the front row here near the end. Rick, uh, what does it say about the state of college basketball that? Uh, Zach and Dalton have both risen to the top under such unique and unheralded starts. I, I think, again, I don't know Zach Eady that well, but uh, just watching him and listening to him and knowing what I know about Matt, uh, and, I, and I know Dalton, obviously, now after being with him for a year, humility, uh, have great humility in the fact that, uh, again, when Dalton came on his visit, he didn't ask about, a big NIL. He didn't talk about that. He didn't talk about starting. He just said, I just want to be part of a program where players get better. I want to be around good players that want to win. We'd love to be able to help help be part of an NCAA team and make a run in March. And I want to be coached hard. And uh, and I would just watching Zach Eady and how he's improved and knowing what I know about Matt, again, I, I think the word I would use with both of them is humility. Thanks, Coach. Fifth row on the left, Tony. Yeah, Rick, Tony Paul, Detroit News. I'm just curious, um, how much are you kind of allowing yourself to enjoy this in the moment, maybe more so than you did 20 years ago, knowing now how difficult it is to get here? Well, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, years ago, I I know I didn't enjoy it as much because – wanting to keep going further and further. And with that, maybe in some ways put more pressure on guys than maybe they should have. But uh, uh, I do know this, it's a player's game. And uh, I know that uh, when we're at this point, we we have done a lot like today. There's not a lot to be done right now other than hope we can get great rest. And uh, But I've never been able to really enjoy it a lot until it's over with because uh, I, I mean, I got back last night. I went to bed at three, woke up at five, and and uh, just thinking, my mind not so. And I think that's probably true of most coaches. You know, when you're this time of year, and then my first thought was when I saw those guys. I asked them how much sleep they got, uh, and uh, because it was, like I said last night, I thought we were playing Friday, Sunday, but we played Sat. We're playing Saturday, Sunday, really, and but. Uh, it's it's uh, when you're when when you're in the midst of it, it's hard because you just got to let it go real quick and get to the next. And you're obviously concerned about every one of your players. And uh, but you do have that feeling after quickly after a win. You know, there's a I don't even know if I'd say it's relief or whatever, but the fact that you're excited for those guys 
and yet excited for for everyone involved in but uh then your mind quickly shifts to what's next just one row up coach in the fourth row hey coach uh, eddie pels with ap you're talking talking about building a program just curious for some thoughts on kind of the impact and the imprint obviously of the of coach summit and the women's program at your school for all these years yeah you know i was fortunate to know uh pat she uh, she and i uh, we were on the converse committee together we used to do a lot of clinics and uh, one thing i really admired about her uh, when she would we'd be at these clinics she would s sit in on them and listen and she always asked questions and uh, we talked about it and uh uh, then we also used the Baden basketball, so we we were around each other. And then uh, she loved talking basketball. I mean, she loved it. And uh, I mean, she was a basketball coach. And uh, but yet, what she built and has built that has sustained at the University of Tennessee, and that's the fact that it, it was a program that uh, was built on work. Uh, they uh, again hearing the stories there and. I've watched uh, how hard Kelly Harper has worked to, to, uh, just to, I mean, think about it. I think they're the only team that's gone to every single NCAA tournament, which is, I mean, unthinkable, really, and, and to do what they've done with the kind of pressure that's been there. And now the ga their game has grown so much, too. But uh, her legacy will uh, will be more than just th those crystal balls. That, that, that's a beautiful thing when you walk into women's. Uh, her legacy goes far beyond that. And... Uh, really in some ways uh, a once-in-a-lifetime coach person that uh, truly made her mark. Thanks, Coach. We're going to move it back to the right side in the fourth row, right near the end. Yep. Hey, Coach. Gabe Prime from the Pre Exponent. Can you talk about game planning for a team that's kind of dual-faceted? They've got the dominant inside guy of ED, but they also shoot the three ball to a high clip. How do you kind of game plan for a team that can go inside but also shoot the ball just as well? Well, again, it goes back to what we were talking about with five guys got to be connected because they're, uh, again, Zach Eady, again, we could talk about them all day, but there's so many other guys on that team we could talk about too that understand their role, they do their job. And uh, you really have to be in uh, relentless pursuit of sustaining your effort uh, for, within a possession. You, you turn your back, you turn your head, you stop for a split second, 0.5 seconds, they're moving around, searching out the three-point line. Uh, back cut. They're, they're, they they know how to play basketball. Again, so well coached, and uh, it takes five guys willing to make a sustained effort for 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 possession after possession after possession, going from play to play to play. Okay, third row on the right. We're gonna have two questions. Hey, Rick. Greg Doyle again from the Indy Star. Um, do you get a sense when you watch teams, especially one you're about to play? There's, I guess, two kinds of schools. Maybe there's, there's those are on the joy ride, and there's here on a business trip. Can you see which one of those two Purdue has looked like? No, I think they've been business like. I, I do. I mean, from the time, we, I mean, over even in Maui. I, again, that tournament. I mean, think about it. In three days, we played Syracuse, Purdue, and and Kansas. And uh, I mean, it's just a great tournament over there. But. Uh, I've always thought that um, again, when you when you have when you're talking about uh, building programs, I think it's always a business approach to it, a work ethic approach to it. Knowing that every time you go out, you got a chance to get better, be better, to try to build to these tight moments. You talked about playing Saturday Sunday effectively. What sense can you make of, if you can make any, of you guys having the late game last night, but you're here first? 12 hours later, and then also, and someone has to play Sunday at two, but, you know, why you? What, 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 please tee off on somebody for me. Yeah, you know what? I mean, you think about all that sometimes, but regardless of what it is, I mean, you know, you're probably what, if I say we went to bed last night at uh, our guys, I think Josiah told me he was in bed at four. I would imagine the Purdue players watched our game and, doing what guys do today, we're probably in bed one thirty-two. so there's probably a two-hour window there one way or the other. The difference is uh, the other game, the second game is being played in, I think, what, ten, uh, central time zone probably. And, but it's, it is what it is. You, you deal with it, and uh, they're young guys, and one of our big things will be recovery, uh, and I'm sure Purdue the same thing because we, we know it's going to be a 
hard fought game. And um, so a big part of today and even last night, we were, and one of the reasons we were late getting out of here last night where we have th three or four guys that they love to take ice baths. And uh, so we had to wait on those guys. That, you know, they jump in it for about seven to 10 minutes. And so it's all about recovery and doing what we need to do to be ready. Back to the left side, coach here in the second row. Josh Horsch, fan sided. You mentioned adding Jordan and Dalton for their offense. And I talked to Dalton about the end of the season. You know, he was getting more shots up and becoming almost heliocentric on offense. How do you balance wanting those guys to get all their looks because they're such good offensive players, Dalton especially, and getting everyone involved because you want to play high ball pressure defense, things like that. And that's hard to ask of somebody when they're not getting touches, they're not getting shots. So how do you balance that buy-in? And what do you tell Dalton uh, whether to look for his shot or look for others? No, I, I tell him, uh, like last night, he took a couple tough shots. And I told him, I said, you're going to have to spray that ball. But, you know, when he makes a couple, he's like any guy that can score. He's going to the old heat check and see if it's going. But, uh, you know, uh, we, we believe in balance. We, in, in the flow of the game, we're expecting those guys to play off the concepts that we talk about, work on from day one. And uh, then on dead balls, yeah, we can make calls and get shots and do those type things, knowing full well that – Purdue, uh, Creighton did a great job of having us scouted, and there's not going to be a lot of easy shots, and you're going to have to you're going to have to take some tough shots and contested shots, and hope you can make them. And we, we got a couple guys that can do that, but uh, you know, there, there's we Dalton and I've had that discussion. You know, when when he needs to uh, facilitate, and uh, and he and he, he's really adjusted well to it. He does. He's he's not a selfish player at all. But sometimes, too, you know that you got to get a guy like that going. So last night early, you know, we started a game uh, running a set for him to try to get one. And tomorrow night it might be we might go a different way. And uh, but uh, we what we've what's got gotten us to this point, we've got to just try to hope that it is enough, and we've got to execute it at a high level. Back to the third. I'm sorry, the third row here on the right side. Ryan Silvio, Rivals.com. Both Jemai and Josiah talked about how SEC play helped in the development of Jonas and Tobey. Do you agree? And what is it about conference play that kind of helps develop a big? Well, our conference this year, I, again, I think when you look at our league, and, and, and everyone, I, I say it, everyone says that their league is the best and this, that, or whatever. But our league, I mean, going into the last week of the season, there, were, we, there was a possibility of having a five-way tie for first place. And coming down the stretch, we had to play Texas A&M, Alabama, Auburn, South Carolina, all those back-to-back. -back. And, uh, and we know each other so well. And it's so hard to, to get clean looks. It's just hard because you just you, – in the conference, that's what makes it so difficult. Coaches know each other. But they've – you know, they, they just, we just know each other. And it's, and it's hard. And uh, so – that, along with, again, our non-league schedule, you know, we, we felt like we had put together a great schedule at the beginning of the year. And at one time, I really kind of thought it hurt us because we weren't able to develop our young players because we were in so many one-two possession games that we weren't able to get those guys out there as much as we'd have liked to. And, but uh, uh, our league uh, is, uh, when I first got there, was a very athletic league, uh, strong physical league. It has changed now where it's not only that, it's the high, we've gotten so much more skill in our league. And great coaches, uh, again, I think there's always been terrific coaches in the SEC and college basketball in general, but uh, it's just, um, and I really think more of a commitment uh, from universities that maybe hadn't done it in the past where every time you go out on the court, you know you're gonna be challenged and there's some, some great deal of physicality in our league. Second row on the left here, Coach. Wes Rucker with 24-7 Sports. Rick, was there any indication that, that y'all had just from anything in practice or meetings or anything that Josiah would start shooting the ball like this again and get more aggressive and, and accurate going into this tournament? No, I, I think the one thing as coaches, we, we all wish we could <clears throat> coach making shots uh, going in anyway. Trying to That's uh, when you – start doing that, but when you work, I mean, Josiah is one of those guys that, uh, like Dalton, like Zakai, uh, just 
hours on hours in the gym by himself. And uh, when he, um, I thought his, his mindset was just terrific yesterday. And uh, he, um, <clears throat> I mean, you've seen this, Wes. We, I mean, he, he's capable of doing it. And uh, right now is when you want, you'd like to see them all go in. But as long as he's taking good shots, and, and I will say this, when it leaves his hand, when he's set up the way we want him to get set up, we think it is going in. But uh, uh, I just hope he can continue to, with his mindset that he's got right now because he was just terrific on defense last night. Last question for Coach in the back left here. Uh, Tanner Johnson with the Daily Beacon. There's so much been made, uh, rightfully so, about Zach Eady and what the interior guys have to do to uh, limit him the best they can. But what about the perimeter players, what you have to do to contain Purdue's guards? They've got some dangerous guys that can drive and, and shoot as well. Again, uh, team defense, you got to have it. Uh, and again, I'm not sure those guys maybe get all the attention they should because I've watched you know a lot of attention go to Dalton where We've got guys on our team that make so many winning plays, things that don't show up in a uh, stat like Jemai Meshack. Uh, uh, the stuff he does that doesn't show up on a, a scouting report is really amazing. Even Zakai, some things that he does, Josiah, I mean, Santi, those guys. And, and I look at Purdue players the same way. They've got guys out there that maybe aren't talked about as much as people might know. But when you watch them getting ready to play against them, you have the utmost respect for them because of how hard they play and how hard they work at doing their job. Coach, thanks for your time. <coughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, guys.
Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't heard back yet. Oh, hold on. Yes, that was correct. Locker rooms are open.
Champion. All right, welcome back to the interview room here at Little Caesars Arena as we preview the 2024 Midwest Regional Final here in Detroit. We're pleased to be joined by the top-seeded Purdue Boilermakers who will face second-seeded Tennessee on Sunday at 2.20 p.m. on CBS. Please remember to silence your cell phones as a courtesy to the team members and other media in the room. Please raise your hand for a microphone to be brought to you, and when you do ask a question, please introduce yourself and your media affiliation. Please note that the recording of press conferences on cameras or on cell phones is prohibited through, throughout the rest of the Midwest Regional. From your left to your right, we are joined by head coach Matt Painter, Braden Smith, Lance Jones, Fletcher Lawyer, and Zach Eady. Purdue student athletes will be available until 4.03 p.m. and we'll be, and then we'll continue with Coach Painter for an, an additional 20 minutes. The student athletes will then go to the breakout rooms off to your immediate right uh, when you exit the, the media room. With that, we'll start with an opening statement from Coach Painter. Uh, obviously really excited about um, being able to compete against Tennessee. Um, thought they obviously had played a really good game against Creighton. Anytime both teams shoot the ball well from three and also shoot the ball well from the free throw line, um, you're, you're going to have just some slight differences on who wins the game. I, I thought Tennessee's just overall toughness and physicality um, was a separator. And that, that was something after we played them in Hawaii that you know really stood out to us. They do a great job of pressure in the basketball. They do a great job of taking away passes and just being physical across the board. And uh, obviously, Coach Barnes is one of the best coaches in the country, but they have all the pieces. Um, they have quickness. They have athleticism. They have good guard play. Um, they have an All-American in Connect who uh, is very, very dangerous. They have, they have good size on their front line. So uh, you know we know this is going to be uh, an absolute battle, and uh, with that being said, you know we're looking forward to it. Thanks, Coach. Let's go to questions, please. We'll start in the front row on the left. Vidank of the Global Kid Media. Coach Penny, you've mentioned multiple times when you have 13 turnovers or less how successful this team is. Tennessee has a relentless defensive pressure, almost full court, and their opponents average 13.1 turnovers per game. What does this team need to do to protect the ball? Yeah, and they're one of the teams that we had. We're six and four when we have over, and even from 14 to 17 turnovers. 17 is the most turnovers we had this year in the game. So from 14 to 17, they're one of the teams that we got to win against. So we're six and four when we get above it. So it's not like we lose all those games. We still win 60% of, um, of those games. You know, it's um, for us, it's being able to get stops you know, so we can push the basketball and kind of get the tempo for them at scoring the basketball and setting their defense. It's the flip of it, right? So they do such a good job of setting their defense and then just getting into you. But it's just handling pressure. It's nothing um, that we haven't seen all year, especially the schedule we've played, just like they've seen everything. They played a great schedule. We've played a great schedule. We're both from great leagues. So we see a lot of things throughout the year. It's just going to be, you know, you hope your defense is better than their offense, and you hope your offense is better than their defense, right? When it comes down to their pressure and, and what they're able to do, you know, you, you've got to be able to pass and catch, but you also got to be able to just handle the basketball with confidence, but also ex execute. You know, we, we run a lot of stuff. And whatever we're doing, just you know, simply do your job, make the right reads, make the right plays and right passes, but be aggressive. As long as you're aggressive, you know, doing what we work on, things are going to work out for us. We'll stay on the left side here in the front row. Sam King, Lafayette Journal and Courier. Matt, I think uh, it was about a few weeks ago, Tom Izzo said, don't, don't judge your program on NCAA tournament success, but you know the deal. That's what you get judged on ultimately. Right. How big of a feather in the cap would this be if you're able to, to kind of get over that hump tomorrow? Oh, it'd be huge. You know, it's been our goal to to win a national championship. So we, you know, we feel like we're halfway there, and uh, we've worked really hard for it. We've had, like you, you know, you're referencing too. We've had some disappointing losses in the NCAA tournament, and you know, you want to rectify that. You you want to use that as motivation. I think we've done that, and uh, just keep playing good basketball. Um, but not to take away, you know, these guys up here. Not all of them have been here the whole time, but Zach has. You know, we've been undefeated non-conference for three straight years and one of the best schedules in the country. And then we won our league by three games in back-to-back -back years. And so um, for the people that compete, the players and the coaches, those things do matter. 
but the, the number one thing is how you play in the tournament. So we've played well so far, but you know, hopefully this is just a start for us. Fourth row on the right. Myron Metcalf, ESPN, Zach, a lot of people talk about the fouls that you draw, but uh, what's it like to sense when guys are just getting tired of you having to guard you and fatigue and everything that sets in, and how do you exploit that in those moments? Yeah, um, obviously teams, they want, like, they, they, they can't just let me get to my spots and let me get my shots. So it's in every team's game plan just to play physical with me. And when you play physical, it leads to fouls. Um, obviously, they, like, it's just kind of part of the game. It's part of their game plan. It's nothing I can really do to change it. Additional questions. Let's go to the uh, third row here on the left. I'm Matt, Bob Kravitz with Indy Monthly. You said the other day that you wanted to build your program without losing your soul. And I wonder if you could expand on that. What does that mean? And does it mean the same thing now in the age of NIL and the portal? No, it really doesn't. It's actually a line I stole from reading one of Tony Dungy's books. And I uh, had a lot of respect for him. I've heard him speak at a clinic in Gainesville and just how he carried himself. Uh, you know, I have a lot of respect. I don't know him personally for how he was. It just seemed like, you know, he coached the game of football but also had his own values. And he wasn't someone who yells and screams all the time. And I'm someone that doesn't yell and scream all the time also. And so I still think you can have discipline that way. But like, you know, you shouldn't be rewarded for doing what you're supposed to do. Like, you know, stand up here and say, hey, we do things the right way. You hear these coaches say that, you know, like you're supposed to do things the right way, right? Like you, you shouldn't get an award for that, you know, but there should be consequences for the people in our business that don't. And that gets pretty frustrating. Um, when we don't have a governing body that can handle situations like that. That's what's frustrating because you're supposed to be setting an example for these guys right here not to have a great basketball career but to have a better life because of the opportunity of a scholarship. And so I think, you know, you, you got to stand for something and, and be able to do things the right way. And if you get your ass kicked and you lose, like so be it. But we glorify too many people who just win at all costs. And I think it's important for these guys to understand that, like, you know, the guy I played for called it being a company man. Like, learn to be a company man. Like, you're going to leave here and go to an NBA organization or go play overseas or go work at Eli Lilly or go work. Do what's best for that organization or do what's best for that company. And if you can do that and put your best foot forward, you know, good things are going to happen. Let's go to the third row here on the right. <clears throat> uh, Todd Golden with CNHI. Braden, uh, it was already spoken about the pressure that Tennessee applies to guards. How do you mentally prepare for that, given how many games you played? And, and also... How many different defenses have you seen against the post feed that you that you try to get into Zach, and how have you kind of dealt with that over your time? Yeah, so Tennessee's a really good defensive team. Um, they got really good defensive guards. So I mean, just handling the ball and just getting the ball in the right spots, I think, is gonna be our biggest kind of just goal. Um, and then once we do that, I feel like if they're out pressuring us, we throw it into Z. It's gonna be hard for them to cover that as well. And then um, what was the part of your second question? Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah, I mean, I think we've been through every situation. I mean, for the two years we've been here and we've played, I mean, I think we've seen everything, we've been through everything, and we kind of just understand, like, if they do this, we'll go do that, or they do that, we go do this. Like, I think we just understand to kind of just move, move along with the game. We're going to go for the next three questions. We're going to be on the left side. We'll go to the third row in the middle. Gabe Fry and Purdue Exponent. Zach, there's a clip going around online of last night of Miles kind of putting the sticker on the bracket after you guys won kind of nonchalantly, nobody's celebrating. As a senior, does that kind of like signify your guys' mindset, like, okay, we won, but that bigger goal's ahead, like, no celebrations, job's not finished? Yeah, for sure. Um, like, we, we, this has been the, the tournament that we've been hyper-focused on all year, uh, obviously. Uh, we were not, obviously, we're not satisfied with just making the Elite Eight. We want to keep pushing. Like, we, we know what we have on this roster. We know what we have in this team. Um, and we know we can accomplish really big things. So we just want to keep pushing and not get too caught up in, in one win. Roll four on the left with Larry. Larry Lage from AP. Lance, how much did you uh, match up with Dalton, uh, connect in the last game, and what does he bring to the table that you have to counter? Um, I matched up with him, you know, a decent amount. Um, you know, he's an All-American, like Coach said earlier. Um, you know, he, he plays with, you know, good pace. Uh, he gets to his spot. Um, so I'm just going to try to limit his, uh, his touches, um, try to make it hard for him, and, and uh, just make it uncomfortable for him. Up to the second row. Uh, Israel Schumann from the Purdue Exponent. Um, just you know, for any of the players, um, 
the way Matt was talking about preparing you guys for, for life, being a company man, um, off the court stuff, you guys have probably played and won for coaches that were a lot different, you know, maybe not all nice guys, uh, you know, quote unquote. So just how different is that and, and how much do you appreciate that? Fletcher, want to take that one? It, uh, it means the world to us. Uh, we put a lot of time into it that our coaching staff does as well. And uh, when you got that level of trust with uh, the guy that's in charge, it means a lot. It uh, puts a lot of trust in us players to go trust one another when the guy at the top of everything puts it all into us as well. We go to the right side here on the first row. Ryan Bonaparte, Hammer and Rails for Lance. You and Dalton Connect have been two of the biggest additions by way of the transfer portal this season. Can you just kind of touch on how important that has been for your career path and um, across the country? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it was a chance that I took. Um, you know, the grass isn't always green on the other side. Um, but, you know, the way that these guys and, you know, the coaches have accepted me with open arms um, has just made this experience so much easier for me. Um, you know, I didn't know what I was going to expect coming into it um, just because I'm, you know, I'm a new kid on the block. But, um, I mean, it's, it feels like I've been here for all my, four, all my five years. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, I enjoy being with these guys every day. You know, like I told them, you know, walking in here, they, they keep me young. We'll go to the second row here with Joe. Joe Rexford with The Athletic for Braden. As you watch the Kai Ziegler play now, how different does he look compared to what you saw from him in Hawaii? Yeah, so I think he was just coming back from injury in Hawaii, so he was just getting a little bit of minutes restriction and stuff. So I think he's a lot more confident player now. Um, he's playing like he did before the injury, and I just think he's a really good player. I mean, he's, he's an All-American uh, level player, so I think it's just going to be tough trying to stop him and just trying to keep him in front of us. Back to the left side in the first row here. Vedant with the Global Kid Media, kind of going back to that company, man, for the players, you've got a maximum of a little over a week of the season left. If you think about the things that Coach Painter teaches you on and off the court, do any of you have a story that you'd like to share that's maybe a funny one? Who wants to start? Who's that question directed to? I mean, he says a lot of funny stuff. He's got a lot of, a lot of funny references. Um, but I think the thing that just sticks with, with us most is just to have fun while, while doing our hard work. Um, I think it kind of, I mean, it's kind of short and sweet, but like it has a lot of meaning to it. I think if you work hard every single day, you come in every single day, but you make it fun and you smile, you have fun, um, I think it uh, makes it a lot better. We'll go to the second row here. Brian Newbert from goldenblack.com. Fletcher. Um, you know, there's a perception out there that you guys shoot a ton of free throws. Zach lives at the foul line, and that's kind of why Purdue wins. But when you look at the games, a lot of the games where you've shot the least free throws are some of your best offensive performances of the year, most efficient offensive performances. Is there something to be said for, like, game flow and it not stopping and starting constantly? The offensive rhythm you get in. Yeah, definitely. I think when we can get out and run in transition and uh, we can get the ball moving, we get into our motion, and uh, it's not just all – Getting it to them on that block and team swarming them and fouling them because when when it does they do swarm like that they do foul them. and it's obvious and if you don't think they do you should just watch more basketball but I think when we get out and we're running and we're making shots it just opens up so much more for Zach to get him more one on one deep touches and then with that that's how we flow and that's how we get more efficient games without the getting stopped at the line all the time. We get out. We go to the second row. I'm sorry, the third row on the right. Uh, yeah, David Cobb from CBS. Uh, for, for Fletcher and Braden, growing up with connections to the state of Indiana um, and understanding the history of this program, what does it mean for y'all to uh, now be a part of, you know, uh, the, this postseason journey and sort of be in the, in the midst of a potentially historic, you know, situation for the program? Braden, want to start that one? Yeah, no, it means a lot, um, especially in Indiana. I mean, it's a basketball state, so, I mean, you just kind of grow up with it, and it's just always been around, and it's been good here. So, I mean, just seeing everything that Purdue has done um, through the years and just – I mean, how good how good they have been and just being a part of this and hopefully making it three more games and just experiencing that with these guys and coach. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that deserve it. And we, we work our butt off every year. And I think winning this would mean the most. Fletcher? Yeah, right now it's everything to us. It's uh, what our minds are on 24-7. And um, 
to see uh, kind of these last few years, kind of how it's played out and how much work these guys and in, in recent years have put in, it, it stinks. And you just want to get the program, the, the university, everything, everybody over that hump. And uh, that's what we want to do and what we're going to work hard as hell to do on Sunday. We're going to have two questions in the second row on the left. We'll start on the end. Yeah, um, Matt, just the way you guys have, have ran, you guys are kind of you know known as big man you now um, through the years. Where did that belief in running your program and, and your system that way come from, and how long have you held it? Yeah, well, just you know, for for me personally, it, you know, Carl Landry was our best player when we had the we got the job, and so he played ten years in the NBA, and um, we circled around him, and then we had a two guard named David Teague, and so like any time you have success in a program, you use your former players as part of recruiting going forward. Um, when it comes to guard play, you know, in the NCAA tournament five years ago, I thought Carson Edwards and Ryan Klein were fabulous. I think it helped us. You know, we, we showed clips of Dakota Mathias and Ryan Klein to Fletch and said, like, you know, here's how we kind of look at you. Here's, you know, where you can – and we ran a lot of stuff for him, right? But we've just seen – you know, Etuan Moore was a great uh, player for us. Jaden Ivey, obviously, here with the Pistons, was a lottery pick. So we've had some really good guards, but like the bigs, it seems like every year we've had a guy, obviously Zach being the best, but you know, from Jawan Johnson to Caleb Swanigan to Isaac Haas to AJ Hammonds um, to Travion Williams, I'm probably leaving somebody out there. We've had some, you know, a lot of all conference bigs. And so when we sit down to talk to somebody who's next, you know, you've got a lot of people there. I think the one thing that you can show now analytically is there's a lot of great programs out there that do not utilize their big guys. And my whole thing is I'm going to circle it around our best players. And, you know, whether you're big, small, in between, it doesn't matter. You know, you got to do what's best for your program. So I let things organically happen. I watch a lot. I break down things and let our coaches work. I just watch people. And I'm a big believer in guys that believe in themselves. And if you don't believe in you and you don't put the work into it, it comes out because everybody has doubt as a player. I don't care who you are. Everybody battles doubt. And so, but who can get through that and who can get through that adversity and really, really believe in themselves. But when you're putting a system together and you've had guys, we've learned a lot through Isaac Haas, through AJ Hammonds to get to Zach. You, you learn a lot. You learn how people handle them. You learn how people foul them. You learn how people double them. And then you just kind of build from that. But when you get to the recruiting piece of it, now you have a lot of data to show them and say, you will get the basketball if this is who you are. You know, I'm not going to throw the basketball to someone who can't get the job done. All right. But if you can get the job done, then, you know, we're going to get you the basketball. But it doesn't hold any differently for our program, um, you know, whether no matter what position you're in. You know, we're, we're just going to circle it around our best scores. And then that's basketball. A lot of people don't talk that way in recruiting. They tell everybody this is how it's going to work for you. Then they get there. Then things change real quick, right? You know, they're going to still go with the best. They're going to do what I say, you know, but they're not always going to say it. And that's where kids got to do a better job of looking through it and, and getting with trustworthy people because, you know, now you want to be able to walk in there and at Purdue you're just on earning ground. If you earn it, you get it. But if you don't earn it, then nothing was promised to you. So now we still have a good relationship. We'll go to the other side here in the second row. Just a reminder, we have about two minutes left with the players. So let's prioritize, prioritize those questions, please. West Rucker, 24-7 Sports. Zach, are, are you the kind of guy who wants to think of a game like this as just another game? Or are you someone who sort of likes, you know, making it a big game in your mind because you think you'll play better? And why do you think you are that, whichever way it is? Well, I mean, it's not another game, so you can't treat it like that, obviously. But it's still just basketball. Uh, the rules are the same as every game we've played. Refs are the same. We've played this team before. Like It's, it's still just basketball, but it's obviously a, a big game. Go to the right side here. Again, one or two more for the players. Matt, uh, do you get a chance this time of year to self-scout very much to pick up on tendencies that you might be giving away to other teams? Does the tournament lend itself to that? Does it muck things up potentially? How do, how do you kind of approach that? The reason I bring that up is on one of the post-game shows last night, I think Jay Wright said that a lot of the post feeds to Zach come in from one side of the floor. And I'm wondering if you give yourself the opportunity to look at yourself that way to yeah. try to figure things out. Yeah, well, the hardest thing to do and handle a post guy is be able to pass from the top because they don't know whether to come from the left or the right. And you're going to use the left block more with the right-handed player because he's more comfortable going over his left shoulder. So, like, the basketball people, like what he said was, you know, 
it's, it's obvious, right? You want a lefty on the other block, you want there. So if you have, you know, Zach Randolph, or, you know, you have Wayman Tisdale, you're going to the other block. You know, that's, you know, because they're strong, they're there. And that's the other thing that really comes into play is Zach's, you know, grown into a really good passer. You want him to naturally be able to pass with his right hand. When he gets to the other block, he can still score and make plays. Like he posted up three or four times on the other block. But when they come on the double, that's where he opens up. So instead of passing across his body, he opens up and then he looks at you. Because anytime you open up and you see it, now you don't want to see two thirds of the court. You don't want to see half of the court. You want to open up and see the whole court because you can always turn back around and put your back to the defender and get your post move. But if not, then you need to pass out, and we do a lot of reposting. So that, that's all he was referencing, something like that. that he wasn't you know, giving any clues to everybody. Rick Barnes totally understands where we're – they know what we're doing. Like, they know what we're going to. We, you know, it's kind of the you're, – you're trying to show a lot of different ways how to do one thing. It's like we do a lot of different ball screens for Braden, and Braden can get a layup, Braden can get a pull up, but Braden's also going to pass and try to manipulate the defense on what you're going to do. But we also run a lot of ball screen things to make you handle all that and stop all that, and then we're getting the ball to Zach. So it's not just you know one screen, throw it, throw it in. But if you're going to allow us to do that, or we got somebody in foul trouble, we get real simple on you. You know we we don't try to over, you know think what's going on. So at the end of the game, you know we call it killing the dragon. You know, we're just going to go to the – if we see something and you can't stop it, we're going to go to it every single time. Like Cam made a great move and scored it. And then he was going to make the same move, and here I am yelling at him, and I probably should just leave it alone because it wasn't that bad of a move. He just traveled. But we, we had him on the hook. And when you got him out of the hook, on the hook and you can get IK out of the game, you can get Anton out of the game, like those are big, big pieces for a team that only wants to play seven people. So if you can get some people there, now they're not, you know – you're getting in the bonus, you're shooting free throws, you're getting their backups in the game. And sometimes the backups are the same, but you're just, there's just a lot of positives there and you're shooting from five feet, right? That's all the time we have for the student athletes, guys. You can head over to the breakout rooms. Again, those are off to your immediate right when you exit the interview room. We'll continue here shortly with Coach Painter for the next 15 minutes or so. Don't forget your phone. Yeah. We'll get those name cards to your way as well. Okay, let's continue with Coach Painter in the back left. I'm sorry, back right. Ben McKee, 24-7 Sports. Matt, I'm curious what you've seen from Zakai Ziegler as you prepare for this game. Obviously, not on a minutes restriction uh, this time around. Your perception of the biggest difference from him early in the season to now? Yeah, um, obviously, you know, Braden mentioned it. You know, he was coming off that, that injury and was on some minutes restriction. And... Um, you know, he's athletic, he's quick, he can break you down off the dribble, he can put good pressure on the basketball. Um, he's one of the best point guards in the country, you know, but, he, but he's a two-way player. You know, you, you have to be a two-way player for Coach Barnes. You know, you, you have to guard. Like, it's, it's not, that's a non-negotiable. And um, so we, we've played him multiple times. You know, we, we played him um, in the Bahamas, we played him in the NCAA tournament, we played him in Hawaii. Um, so, so we've had a lot of experience of going against him and how competitive they are. Um, but, you know, as, you know, Coach Barnes' point guard, like, he's got to run the show, but he's also got to set the tone from a defensive standpoint and, and get into the ball handler and put pressure on the ball. So he's one of the best players in the country. Let's go to the second row here. Matt, just kind of going back to your comments on the coaching profession, just wondering, first of all, your relationship with, with Rick Barnes and then also just kind of how you view his career from, yeah. from afar. Well, obviously, he's hung in there for a long time. You know, I don't, I don't know if I'll be able to, to match that. Um, in, in terms of years, um, but like um, his teams always play hard, they always compete. Um, you know, and he reminds me of a lot of the guy I played for. To be frank with you, you know, it's you know you know what you're you know what you're getting, man. But you got to be ready to fight. You know, it's not two hand touch. It, you know, it, it's it's tackle football, man. You you got to be hooked up, and you got to be ready to go. Um, and if you do that, then you got a chance to win. Uh, doesn't mean you will win. But if you don't, then you have no chance to win. But no, I got a lot of respect for him. You know, he's he's a good guy. He's a good coach. I don't know him that well. We've had a couple conversations, obviously, when we we played in Hawaii. But um, no, I got a lot of respect for him. Reminds me a lot of Coach Katie. Third round, the right. Hey, Coach uh, Eddie Pels with AP. You you talked a lot or a little today about not making promises that you aren't sure yeah. you're going to be able to keep. So like against that backdrop, I'm just kind of curious, 
Like, what do you think of NIL yeah. and, and the world we're in now where a lot of kind of promises get right. made? Well, I think there's nothing wrong with making money off your name, image, and likeness. It's just not name, image, and likeness. You know, it's in the spring, it's an auction. You know, and so, like, but these guys generate a lot of money, and there's nothing wrong with them, you know, getting paid for it. And if that's their market value, then so be it. But um, they didn't do a good job of, of, of putting the proper guardrails on there. I think they're up. I don't think they're up against it. They're up against it. Um, they, they simply don't win any court cases. And, you know, I think you, you, we got to really look at the structuring of everything. They obviously need some help. And they haven't gotten that help. And, you know, we'll see how things go. I think Charles Baker is really trying to do that. I've been in those rooms and I've sat there and we've talked about it. The thing that really happened was the timing of the portal, name, image, and likeness, and COVID all at the same time. It was just such a slam. And, and now it was so hard, you know, for that. But, you know, these guys generate a lot of money and there's, there's nothing wrong with them getting paid. But we got to figure out a system how to do this, but calling it something that it's not. And there's nothing wrong with someone making money off their name, image, and likeness. But, you know, you're getting in the spring here and it's just, you, I can't recruit a kid and we got great education and we got great people because I don't have a good number. Like that, that wasn't the intentions. But we, we threw it out in the pond without proper guardrails, and now here we swim. So I signed a lot. I signed a lot of guys in the fall, and I, 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 I stay out of the spring. The spring stinks. And so all these guys are talking about that. I'm not. So when our season's over, like, you know, we're, maybe people leave, right? It's going to come and find me at some point. But we've had, uh, going to the fourth year, we'll have two transfers in four years, and that's the fewest amount in high major. So I'm not the... I'm not the person to really, to really talk about that. But at low to mid majors, when you get good players, and then you know you got to be able to get them, then you got to be able to keep them. If you can't keep them, you can't grow them. So like, how are they supposed to survive? And you guys keep seeing good mid major teams and low major teams pop up and here and there. And but like, you know, they're the ones that recruited them. They're the ones that thought they were a good player. Us high majors didn't think they were good enough. But now once they get there, you just you lose them. So it's like. Like, it doesn't seem fair, right? And, and if any time somebody's not happy, they should be able to transfer. So I served as the only coach on the, the one-time transfer subcommittee. And I always said, like, i got to change my resume for the three-time, one-time transfer subcommittee. Because when they said that, that was it, right? They said, like, when you use your one-time transfer. So, like, what I thought was made sense to it was not allow, not let somebody after their first year transfer um, and use their one-time transfer after that first year. After your second and third year, then be able to use that one-time transfer. Now it's like they, they just keep moving. Like we've had a couple guys in our league that have already used it, and now they, you know, there's no extenuating circumstances, and they're just going to transfer. Well, there's a lot of coaches last spring that were told, hey, those guys aren't going to be eligible. So they didn't recruit those guys because they already used their one-time transfer, and then they end up being eligible. And now they feel like, hold on now. You know, we called the NCAA. We talked to people in power. They said, no, they've already used it. And since they haven't graduated, they can't now, you know, be eligible. And then they end up getting eligible because they get a waiver or they, they threaten to sue or, or whatever they, they did. Each situation's different. So um, just a lot of confusion. I think a lot of times when you hear coaches such as myself talk, like this doesn't affect me personally. It, it, it's affecting the masses, though. When you hear that, you, you, it, it sounds like sour grapes, but we just want an even playing field so we know how to operate. And then what, what you don't want is 99% of these kids aren't pros, but so many people getting scholarships, whether you get it through athletics or something else, really springboards you into a better situation in your life and your career. So that's what I always tell these guys. I mean, you're going to be a former athlete, former basketball player for 50 years. Like, think about that. Like, use this opportunity to now have a better life, not just a better basketball career, without stealing your basketball dream. And so if you can have that balance and that understanding and that perspective, then, you know, you're beating the system because now you're a good basketball player. Now, you know, you can use the brand of Purdue, but if you've jumped around with three, four schools in five years, like you've been loyal to nobody. And now maybe you played better at a certain place or you got more touches, you got more shots. Well, what about, you know, I'm not in this position without Gene Cady and Bruce Weber. Sorry. 
It just, you know, I don't, my out of bounds plays aren't that good, you know, but those guys looked after me. Those guys helped me, but I was a bad basketball player and I stayed and we stayed loyal. And now when I need someone to help me, they pick up the phone and they've helped me and I've gotten into this position because I've had a lot of help from Purdue people, not just in this job, but in other jobs. Some of these guys and what they get into, man, we all know like who's connected you to your job. Like nobody just gets things on their own all the time. We have people that help you. And I always talk to our guys about, think about the success you've had. Now write down every person on a piece of paper that's helped you. I bet you need another piece of paper. You know, we all need that help. And, and that's all I'm trying to do is trying to make sure that these guys, and I've been on the phone with student athletes that are on these committees and try to talk to them and say, you want the freedom to do whatever the hell you want. And I just want what's best for you. Like think if you just did whatever the hell you want and your parents just, to, just let you do what you want. Like where would you be? Like you gotta have some people that sit around and say, no, we're not doing that. This is what's best for you. And if some of this stuff we're talking about is best for them, then so be it. But we, we've gotten away from that. We're, we're dodging lawsuits. And I think there's student athletes out there that are getting punished for it, even though they get to move and do what they want. Let's go to the front row here on the right. Matt, it's no secret that Braden and Zach are two of the most effective players in the country. Um, does it feel any more effective for these two just because they play the one and the five? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a really good question. Um, because if you talked in theory about basketball, I think that's where you would start. You know, But some of the greatest basketball players, if not the greatest basketball player ever, is not a point guard, really, and is not a five. And so like, there's value at every position. And I don't want to take away from that. But you would probably start with those two positions, especially from a point guard standpoint. Um, in, in today's game, you know, you need that floor general. Obviously, Zach has been able to dominate when he gets it, but you know, they take a lot of things away from Zach, and then he gets on the glass too. So he earns his. Like you know, it, it, sometimes it's different how he earns it, but he, he's always working and trying to get there. But no, both of those guys are, you know, pillars, you know, in, in our system and what we do. But I, I think they'd be pillars at a lot of places. Let's go to the left side in the third row, in the middle. Hey, Matt. Bob Kravitz, Indy Monthly. As a Cubs fan, you know something about delayed gratification. Yeah. Now, it's only been 44 years, not 100 and whatever it was with the Cubs. <laughs> but do you sense, being around Purdue people, the level of desperation they feel to finally get over the hump? Yeah. I, you know, I feel it. You know, I was a Purdue basketball player, and then I was a Purdue fan. Then I was a Purdue assistant coach. Now I'm the Purdue head coach. So every, everybody feels it. No different than rooting for the Cubs. Like, you know, you, you just want it, right? That's your passion. Um, I'm a little bit different towards the Cubs than probably people are towards me, you know, because I, I understand that there's tough decisions to be made. And, um, and, and it's hard and it's competition and there's a lot of people out there. And, um, but yeah, I think, you know, we feel it just like them because we pull for Purdue. You know, we pull for other sports at Purdue. You know, we want to see Purdue do well. Um, but yeah, you know, it's been, a, it's been a long time since you've been to a Final Four. And, um, you know, we, we'd like to be able to accomplish that. But we know Tennessee's in the way and they have a great team. And, um, you know, we're going to have to play well. We'll stay in the third row. Coach, earlier you talked about how your guys' game is getting those stops and playing in transition. How much does it help you guys to have a guard like Braden that's so willing to crash the board instead of some guards that kind of wait, let the big man get the board? Braden gets that board and he's immediately going. Right. Yeah, it's great that he's not a great box out guy, but he's great at going to get it. So anytime you deal with someone like Zach, who's going to get, you know, around 10 defensive rebounds a game, maybe he's not quite there in his average, but he's going to get a lot, right? You know, to have another player that, <coughs> that is quick to the basketball, that can get those long rebounds and push it. Because I always say, talk about, you know, you know, tough perimeter shots should be like turnovers, you know, because normally they, you know, when someone takes a really tough shot, sometimes it can surprise their teammates. Sometimes the way the ball, you know, gets off the rim because it's a bad shot or a bad three or a low shot clock play. You know, let's use those, let's treat them like turnovers. Everybody seems to sprint when you see that turnover. So then you get that advantageous break, right? You get a primary break, whether that's four on two, four on three, three on two. But you got to try to do that from rebounding too. So if you got the ball already in the hands of the person that you want to push it, so when, when he gets the rebound, we push it. When everybody else gets the rebound, they look for him. And uh, he's done a great job of that for us in transition this year. We'll go to the third row here. 
just kind of time for a couple more guys. Hey, Matt, uh, David Cobb, CBS Sports. Um, what was your perception of Purdue basketball growing up, and what's been the secret sauce of uh, 44 years with just two coaches for, for, for your program? Right. Um, it's interesting because I grew up an Indiana fan. So my, my, most of my family went to Indiana, so I grew up an Indiana basketball fan. And then I rooted against Purdue. And then when they started recruiting me, you know, I was, you know, I was emotional more than anything. And I was like, you know, I don't like Purdue. I'm not going to, I don't want to go to Purdue. And my dad has two degrees from Indiana. And he just said, it was my first lesson in recruiting. And I've always used it in recruiting. And he just said, Purdue has uh, good education. And he just says, and Purdue always wins more than they should. And they have a great head coach and he's got discipline. And he just said, and, and you're going to play for someone who has discipline. And he was a big coach Knight fan. And so, like, that was along the lines right there. And he said, you know, it's what I said earlier in here. He, you know, you're, you're not going to do what you want to do. You're going to do what's best for you. And that, that always resonated with me in, in terms of any decision I've ever made. And so, like, I, you, you got to do some things you don't want to do, but it's still better for you to do that. And don't always think about yourself. You know, think about others around you and, and, and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, that's – I wonder why their gym was so damn dark when I was a kid. Do you guys remember – do you remember that? Anybody here? Indiana people? Their gym was dark, and they, they, they flipped the lights on my freshman year. So that was the last year. So when they had games, the, the court was lit and the stands were dark. And so – and we would always – so when you grew up – I don't want to sound old here – but, you know, cable hit in 1980, 81. That meant 12 channels. That was cable then, okay? But besides that, you had your three channels, main channels, and you had channel four, which was kind of fuzzy. So you had to get your rabbit ears with the tinfoil and get them all lined up. But that's what covered Big Ten basketball. Raycom covered Big Ten basketball. So that's all you knew before ESPN hit or your game of the week on CBS, on NBC, on the weekend. So that's all you knew. So you knew the Big Ten, but you knew the elite schools in the country because they're in the game of the week. But anybody in between, you really didn't have a feel for until the NCAA tournament came. The coverage was just so different. So like that was Big Ten country. So when you started to get recruited, like when other people would jump in, they just didn't have the same affinity as, as a Big Ten school would have for you. Like I wanted to play in the Big Ten. And then it came down to Minnesota, Michigan State, and Purdue for me. I really, I really chose Purdue because of Coach Katie. And when he left our home, I was like, man, everybody else said, like, back then you didn't stay in the summers and all the time, like, or, or at all. And so, like, everybody else gave me choices. You could do this in the summer. You could do this. And Coach Katie didn't give me any choices. He says, you will go to summer school, or if you don't, you will get a job. You need to learn to get up and wake up early in the morning and get to work. I was like, the hell with that. Like, you know, you're 17, 18 years old. You're like, I want to shoot jumpers and eat pizza and, you know, have a hell of a time. And so I walked out of there and I told my dad, like, man, I don't know about that. And he said, that's the only person who told you the truth. He goes, you know, you need him way more than he needs you. And that was a good choice, even though I stunk as a player. We got one time for one more in the front row and then we've been waiting here for a while. Sam King, Journal and Courier. Matt, you've talked about how unbearable you are after losses, how hard it is as a coach to take those. I wondered, the 2019 Elite Eight, If I guess how – you don't let it consume you, but I imagine that one was harder to get over right. than most, right? Yeah. It had been much harder if you made a mistake. Um, I just felt like, you know, when we were up three and they came down with – about 14 seconds to go if it could get to a manageable – you know, if you foul too early there, you know, it gets to be too much time and a lot more things can happen. Everybody says, you know, you're up three. You have to foul. You have to foul when the time's right. Um, if it's too much, then, you know, now they can, they can play the foul game to you. And I've done that before. I've fouled pretty early. Then you got to play the foul game again if they go again and they foul quick. And, but we got our foul around five and a half, five seconds, and that was – you know, it wasn't perfect, but it was in the, in the scenario, it was perfect. And then to be able to get that tap back and for them to make that play. The other thing that people don't realize is that we're up under a minute in overtime. And they, and they, make, a, they, make, a, they make a shot, and then we come down and we don't make a shot. And then now we have to foul, and we never recover from that. So, um, but there wasn't anything that any of our guys did wrong or like coaching wrong. Sometimes when you go back and you make a mistake late in the game like that, and you're like, you're going to really beat yourself up when you make a mistake. And, and you do make mistakes, obviously. 
um, that wasn't one of the situations. But a lot of times our mistakes you guys don't even realize, you know, um, at, at times. So, um, but yeah, it's um, that uh, that was tough. But in, you know, I was still happy for Tony Bennett. You know, it stunk that we couldn't do it, but. I was happy if it was going to be anybody. I, I was glad it was him and the way he's operated, the way he's done things. He's been great for college basketball. Thanks, Coach. We appreciate your time. All right. Thank you.